Look around the coaster world as we know it today. So many coasters, so many manufacturers, so many elements, so much technology. Everything you see got to start somewhere, and I wanted to see who was responsible for all of it. How did we end up with what we have today? Let's run down every major coaster manufacturer and find each one's greatest contribution. I know I usually like to rank things up, but I don't think that really works here. I'm going to run these down in alphabetical order. Before we get started, if you can drop this video a like, I'd appreciate it. It helps me out with the YouTube algorithm. Aerodynamics was the model of innovation. I made a whole video with just their contributions. That included the first true attempt at a suspended coaster, as well as the first modern inversion with the corkscrew. But if you saw that video, you know the number one spot was the steel tubular track. This was introduced on the Matterhorn, and it's still, to this day, the weapon of choice for most manufacturers. Whenever you see a train wrapping its wheels around three sides of those tubes on either side of the track, you can thank Aero. B&M has brought us a lot over its 30 plus years. One of the big ones was the dive coaster, and the spring-loaded wheels that allowed for a true vertical drop. But I don't think there's any doubt that B&M's best contribution was the inverted coaster. This debuted as Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America in 1992, doing what other manufacturers thought was impossible, flipping an inverted coaster upside down. Vacoma, Intamin, and others have replicated this. And for about 10 years, everyone seemed to buy a B&M invert. Custom Coasters International, or CCI, lasted from 1992 to 2002. And I think their best contribution was the hybrid wooden coaster. This is a wooden track with a steel structure. When they opened Hoosier Hurricane in 1994, that was the first wood hybrid since 1973, that being Comet at Funway Amusement Park in Florida. This became a good alternative for seaside wooden coasters, or wooden coasters in humid climates. And CCI would use a steel support structure on 11 coasters, with Gravity Group and GCI doing the same. Chance Rides has an interesting catalog, but we're going back to their most popular model, the toboggan. This was the first vertical lift hill that I could find, going back to 1966 at Sportland Pier, New Jersey. This is something that's been adopted by a bunch of manufacturers, from Zierer to Gerslauer to Intamin. You can thank the Chance Toboggan. The Din Corporation was around from 1983 to 1992, founded by Charles Din, the man behind the beast. This was a great contribution itself, but I'm only looking at the Din Corp. I give them credit for the giant wooden coaster craze. In the early 90s, they were pushing the envelope. First, the Texas Giant in 1990, standing 143 feet tall. In 1991, there was Mean Streak, 161 feet tall. Not only did this advance the limits of a wooden coaster, it also made for some great RMCs. All these were converted between 2011 and 2018. Great Coasters International, or GCI, came about shortly after Din went under, and their trademark was the wooden twister. For the most part, wooden coasters were linear out-and-back models, or they copied the Cyclone, which is more of a double out-and-back model. GCI came out with Wildcat in 1996, starting with a twisted drop and following a custom layout. That became their hallmark, with coasters like Roar, Gwazi, Lightning Racer, Thunderhead, and so many more since then. This hasn't really been adopted by other manufacturers, but it's added a fresh take on the wooden coaster. Gerstlauer got started in the late 90s, and their sixth coaster did something that had never been done before, a beyond vertical drop. Build Spinette opened at Denmark's Bon Bon Land in 2003 with a 97 degree drop. Since then, other manufacturers have pushed this limit further, from SNS to Premier to RMC, but Gerstlauer still owns this record. TMNT Shellraiser reaching an insane 121 and a half degrees. Giovanola only built three coasters, but they did teach us one thing. We now know you can make a 250 plus foot coaster, take up a huge chunk of land, and do absolutely nothing with it. The Waste of Space Award goes to Gio Vanola. The Gravity Group has been very ambitious over the last 17 years, but they've kind of worked backward. Their craziest projects came first, and they've moved on to more family oriented rides. I think those are their best contribution. There have been family style wooden coasters in the past, but they're very old fashioned. The Gravity Group has struck a balance between family friendly and thrilling, fun for all ages. These are affordable, about 40 feet tall, about 1200 feet long, full of airtime, smooth. A lot of parks can use these. Hopkins hasn't given us much. I can't really think of anything. I guess they gave us some weird janky loops. Intimate is just like Arrow. They got their own video full of innovations and contributions. Of all the amazing things that Intimate has done, I think the LSM launches are most important. This was introduced on Superman the Escape at Magic Mountain and Tower of Terror at Dreamworld back in 1997. Other launch systems have been introduced since then, but this one has really emerged at the top of the class. Premier Rides has adopted this over the LIM launch. B&M has used it, Gerslauer, Zero, Vacoma, so many others. This seems to be the most reliable and efficient option to launch a train. Jin Ma Rides, also known as Golden Horse, is known for ripping off other manufacturers. I guess that's their claim to fame. They can mimic B&M, Vacoma, Intamin. It doesn't matter. You think of it, they'll mimic it. Just weirder. Mock Rides has been coming on strong over the last 10 years. They're not just powered coasters and Wild Max anymore. 
There's a lot to love about the Extreme Spinner, the spinning inverting launch coaster, but I'm gonna say their best contribution is the special back car experience. They seem to be designing either a backwards row or a spinning back car on their rides, and the parks make that an upcharge. Existing coasters are even adding this on. I really wonder if other manufacturers will follow suit on this one, as this is still kinda new. Maurer has built some funky rides over the years, but their best contribution has been the Skyloop. It's a very short, very compact coaster model, but it offers a ride experience you can't find anywhere else. The vertical lift turns over, flips you upside down, and then you fly through a double inversion. It's very gimmicky, but it's a one-of-a-kind experience, something I hope to do soon. Morgan is known for their long, smooth, air-timeless hyper coasters, but they have done one thing that nobody else has even come close to, and that's the 8,000-foot coaster. Steel Dragon 2000 has 8,133 feet of track, just an absurd number, and it's at the bar that nobody else even wants to try and beat. Well, except for those mountain coasters that are over three miles long. Pax is a Russian manufacturer that makes small rides, and I guess you can say the scorpion tail on Cobra at Connie Land is kinda cool. Kinda gimmicky, but something I'd still like to experience. Pinfari is known for one thing, and that's their Zyklon Galaxy models. I think this is their best contribution. Without these compact portable coasters, you may not have coasters at fairs or really small parks. Usually, the Pinfari is the best coaster at the fair. You might also ride their Wacky Worm. These are at every fair and roadside park you can imagine. Premier Ride specializes in launch coasters, and they were the first ones to introduce a magnetic launch. Intamin had the LSM in 1997, and in 1996, Premier had the LIM launch with Flight of Fear. This has fallen out of style, the last one opening 10 years ago, but this was prominent from 1996 to 2006. Intamin even joined in before switching to LSMs. Magnetic launches have become a dominant force, and it all started with Premier. PTC, or Philadelphia Toboggan Coasters, is one of the oldest coaster companies out there. Before DIN, and CCI, and GCI, it was PTC building all the major wooden coasters in the 20th century. They were really a pioneer when it came to the large-scale wooden coaster. Their last one opening in 1976, and they passed the baton to the next generation. RMC, or Rocky Mountain Construction, has been a superstar over the last 10 years. They get so creative with their elements, really popularizing the Outer Banked Hill. But their best contribution has been their iBox track. At first, they used this to retract wooden coasters to give it the fully steel ride experience. And eventually, they started building these from the ground up. That iBox track, smooth as can be, doing all kinds of crazy acrobatics on a wood structure. This has given parks a cheap way to turn an aging, unpopular wooden coaster into the best coaster in their park. RCCA, or the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, is the anti-RMC. Their reputation is bad, their rides are rough and have been from the start, but I will give them one thing. They gave us the first inverting hyper wooden coaster. We haven't seen any wooden coaster crack the 200 foot mark since Son of Beast. But starting in 2013, we started seeing inversions on wooden coasters once again, thanks to RMC and the Gravity Group. SNS focused on flat rides for a long time, but used their drop tower technology to start building coasters. Most notably, the compressed air launch. This has been exclusive to SNS, but it has given us some of the most powerful launches in the world. In America, we've seen Hypersonic XLC, Powder Cake, and now Max Force, the fastest acceleration in America. SNS also holds the world record with Dodo Dampa, 0 to 112 miles per hour in 1.6 seconds. That launch is so crazy, they think it could be causing spine injuries. The SBF Visa Group has found their niche with their best contribution, their figure eight spinning coaster. This is so great because it allows anyone anywhere to have a coaster. Small parks, fairs, family fun centers, even pizza places. These are affordable, popular, and fun for kids and adults. They've sold over 120 of these in eight years. Schwarzkopf was on the cutting edge back in the 60s and 70s. So many steel coasters of that era came from Schwarzkopf, many of them portable. I think their best contribution was the circular vertical loop. Arrow came up with their own loop the same year that Revolution came out, with Cedar Point's core screw, but the Schwarzkopf one was much more round and powerful. You still find these on so many of their coasters from the 70s, like Mindbender, Montezuma's Revenge, and the most intense set of loops on Shockwave. Taken back to back, it'll make you gray out. Skyline is not my favorite manufacturer, but they have done a lot of work with GCI on some of their best coasters. I think their best contribution is their flat ride coasters. They haven't been good so far, but it's a good concept if they can get it right. This is like a thrilling version of an SBF spinner. Maybe family fun centers can buy these and they can be very popular. Togo goes way back with their funky style and possibly their weirdest innovation is their greatest, the stand-up coaster. In 1982, they added stand-up trains to two of their existing coasters. And in 1984, they opened King Cobra at Kings Island as a true stand-up coaster. Not everyone loves these, most people probably don't, but stand-up coasters had their time in the coaster world. Arrow added stand-up trains on some of their rides. Intamin and then B&M made them bigger. And by 2000, it was pretty dead. Vekoma came up in the 70s as Arrow's little brother, and it wasn't until recently they stepped up their game. They flooded the world with boomerangs and SLCs, but I don't think that's a great contribution, even though it was impactful. I think their best contribution was the Flying Dutchman. This was the first large-scale attempt at a flying coaster, and in the end, it was kind of a flop for Vekoma. 
They only sold three. They had lots of issues. But two years later, B&M had a flying coaster of their own, and that has been extremely successful. Vigand is known for one thing, alpine coasters. And that's obviously their best contribution. This has allowed ski resorts and other standalone tourist traps to have their own coaster. Not just any small coaster, but a long, fun ride that slides its way down the side of a mountain. You can even control your own speed. I've ridden two of these, and I've loved each one. With that terrain layout, these aren't too expensive to build, and they charge at least $10 per person to ride. Sometimes way, way more, so it's profitable. Zamperla, coaster-wise, has nothing for this list. But when it comes to flat rides, they really dominate the market. Their giant and giga discoveries are better than most coasters that I've ridden, so I'll give them credit for this as their best contribution. These are amazing. Last one, Zier. This was a tough one to pinpoint, but in 1994, they built a coaster called Dragondelbahn in Germany. This was the only spinning coaster Zero ever built, but it was the first new spinning coaster in over 40 years, back when the Virginia Reel was popular. After this, Intamin, Maurer, Gerslauer, and others got back into making spinning coasters. I don't know if Zero inspired them, but they got their foot in the door first. That's a wrap on every major manufacturer's most important contribution. Let me know what you think of my picks, if you would have gone with something else for any of these, and why. Before you go, don't forget to drop a like, and give me a sub for more content just like this. Also, check out my links below for my Discord server, and my second channel, where I post copyright-free off-ride footage, and my baseball channel, if you love baseball as much as I do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.